Talmor, Sheshin Mugachi. Talmor is my home. My family have worked the land for generations. My gran says the island does not belong to us, but we belong to the island. And we must be ready for a great evil is coming. And death follows with it. Listen and subscribe to the latest season of Undertow, The Harrowing, a story glass production presented by Realm, available wherever you get your podcasts. The thing that I fought tooth and nail to bring my son into is Dungeons and Dragons. That is the ultimate solution to parenthood. I'm Alexis Ohanian. In my podcast, Business Dad, I'm hoping to open up the conversation about balancing careers and family. I talked to Rain Wilson. I wanted to learn more about Rain's advice to play D&D with your kids. Business Dad is available now, so be sure to listen and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. world and welcome back to another episode of thanks for coming in i'm your host jillian claire y'all every week it just feels like we're living through an unprecedented moment and i'm 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 kind of sick of it y'all but hey trump was impeached for a second time (laughs) didn't even know that was possible but hey he uh he likes to win so he now is the most impeached president in history. What a win. What a victory. Next time I talk to y'all, Joe Biden will be president. Super excited about that. Super excited to have Kamala as our first female VP, shattering those glass ceilings. Let's go. Very excited. And today on the show, I have Michael Judson Berry. If you've been on the internet the past nine months, then you know who he is. He does Quarantine Time as Moira Rose from Schitt's Creek, and it's the funniest thing in the world, and I was super excited to talk to him. So here's my conversation with Michael Judson Berry. Welcome to the show, Michael. Thank you. How are you on this fine day? Oh, I'm doing well. Staying warm as winter has decided to descend upon us. <laughs> oh, yes. You're on the East Coast, huh? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's freezing. <laughs> that's hysterical because it's like so hot in my office right now that I have the air conditioning on. <laughs> uh, grass is always greener. <laughs> <laughs> truly, truly. Um, well, welcome to the show. It's it's so nice to talk to you. I'm, I'm happy to have you on this week. I got to say, I watched basically every <laughs> every video of Moira Rose that you've done and they are superb. I don't know how you do it, but it's amazing. Oh, well, thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um thank you. I honestly don't know either. I I never actually like sat down and practiced the voice. It just sort of happened. Um so it's been such a wonderful little happy accident. So thank you. That's hysterical. What um what made you decide to start doing quarantine time? Because it's really become such a, a huge thing. And it's so funny. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, it, uh, it started early in the lockdown, I guess our first lockdown last spring. And uh, I'd been doing lots of improv uh, at the pit before the year before. And, um, and so I was still doing sort of online improv jams and things like that with friends there. And um, and all of that, all my comedy writer friends were all, you know, creating podcasts and web series and doing all these amazing things. And um, I thought, I, I was like, well, I'll try something. And my roommate <laughs> and I, my roommate who introduced me to Schitt's Creek and does an amazing David, um, he and I oh did one God. of those. Oh, yeah, he's amazing. He did what we did one of those um, Instagram challenges and it was an impersonation challenge. Oh, yeah. And so we did Moira and David and our friends thought it was really funny. And so that's where I was like, well, maybe this will be it. And she's always drinking tea on the show. Mm-hmm. So I said, I was like, well, what if we do like tea time with Moira and David and each week we'll give sort of our perspective on what's going on. And he had no desire to do this. <laughs> um, but luckily he had a bunch of old wigs from Halloween costumes in the bottom of his closet. So I just Amazing. did it myself. Um, yeah. And it was just sort of a little inside joke. And uh, I think the second video I did got a few thousand views and 
So I remember my friend who does drag messaged me and he was like, Michael, if this is going to be a thing, brush your hair. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> and then my mom called me and she was like, Michael, if people are going to watch this, make sure they stay positive and uplifting because that's what we need. <laughs> And so it, it sort of became this challenge where every few days or so I'd plop a wig on my head and look around and be like, well, what's sort of a happy, hopeful message I can give today? But from Moira Rose's very specific perspective. So it's, it's so sorry, that's good. A long-winded answer, but um, yeah. No, I love it. I mean, it's so it's so smart too, because Schitt's Creek is this revolutionary show that everybody loves. Heck, even for Christmas, my best friend got me a rose motel keychain (laughs) um it's it's this great show and for you to do something um this creative with that character is really impressive thank you yeah and I think that's the nice thing about that show is it's it's such a a beautiful sort of escape I guess it's like uh, imagine if the world was like this world and so I've tried to stay very true to that tone of like you know, you can still be a little sarcastic and push buttons, but at the same time, like stay in this sort of like kind of lovely, uplifting, positive world. Mm. So yeah, that's very true. It is, it is kind of this this perfect world that, or not perfect, but closer yeah. to what we all could hope to live in. <laughs> yeah, all those. I mean, they they can be kind of wacky at times, but they're all just so delightful, and everyone mm-hmm. is so nice. It's true. It's true. Um, and what yeah. got you? into acting because obviously I mean to develop a character and be able to impersonate a character as complicated as Moira Mm -hmm. I mean you've had to have studied your butt off your whole life (laughs) yeah actually kind of yeah I uh I I did my first show when I was six dang Um, yeah because I uh I was very ADD well still am obviously but like (laughs) hyperactive and made my parents insane and they're like we need to find this kid a hobby And just get him out of the house. And uh, (laughs) my mom grew up just outside New York City. And so she grew up seeing Broadway shows and and loving theater. And my dad was a professional musician for a long time. Mm. And so, and luckily I grew up in Syracuse, New York, which has a lot of regional and local theater. And so in 06, my my mom had my older sister and I audition for The King and I. She was like, it'll be good for you to just try it. (laughs) <laughs> and we both got into the show. My sister hated it. I loved it. I got a little moment where I got a laugh. And so I was just sort of hooked. And um, yeah. so I did theater all growing up um, in sort of that like regional or uh, upstate New York area um, and taking dance lessons and voice lessons um, and then went to Boston University and got my BFA. And um, and then I've spent the my adult life I guess going back and forth between acting and casting actually because I did a a casting internship right out of school on uh, CSI Miami um, to just learn about the business yeah and ended up really liking it and so I've just sort of had these two kind of parallel careers where I just sort of bounce back and forth Um, that's that's really cool because I think as an actor the more that we can understand the actual process of filmmaking the better we are at our jobs oh for sure like, I think every actor should at least be, like, a reader um, for a casting director so you can get a sense of uh, what really goes on. And I think it makes it a lot less scary because at least all the casting directors I work for in both New York and L.A. are all super nice. Everyone I worked for is really nice. And they're, like, really rooting for the actors to be good. Um, right. They need the actors to be good. They yeah. want to hire someone. Yeah. The the best problem you can have is having too many good choices. <laughs> Um, honestly, they're like, please, God, everybody be brilliant. Just everybody, you know, Yeah. like they're really rooting for you, which then when I go into an audition just makes me feel so much better. Just knowing that that's the mindset coming in. And it's like, okay, you're a friend, not someone to be feared. Right, right. Because it can get very twisted very quickly in your head. Oh, for sure. You can walk out and they're like, they hated me. They didn't let me do a second take. This is awful. And it's like, (laughs) no, you probably were just so good. And they're an hour and a half behind schedule and they didn't need to have you do it again. You were fabulous. Go home and, you know, celebrate. (laughs) Honestly, that's one of the reasons why when I go into auditions and I know they're behind, if I only do it one time, I'm like, oh, I did good. That's why they're letting me leave. (laughs) Basically. Yeah. They're like, oh, thank God. She was great. You can go. Bye. Like they only needed to see one scene. They're like, Oh, that one was great. Cool. We know she's got it. We don't want to. Let's keep moving. (laughs) That's amazing that you've worked in casting. And how long have you been doing that too? Well, it started out of college um, Mm -hmm. when I did that internship uh, where I met Melissa Delizia, actually, who she was the the assistant and I was the intern. And now she's one of my best friends and she's 
where I ended up working for her years later when she started her own company. Oh, wow. It was her first ever assistant associate. Um, we did <laughs> history and that. She's amazing. She's a brilliant casting director. But yeah, so I did that internship and then I came back to New York and um, interned with Jim Carnahan for a while. I got a sense of, you know, how Broadway works and how that community works because it's so different from TV. It's such a different right. style. Um, so that was an amazing experience working in Jim's office. Cause and the we audition there. process is so, so different as well. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, doing like, I remember I did the, with Carrie Gardner, who was an associate at the time, we did all the open calls for the Spring Awakening tour. And oh my gosh. Oh, also when actors are like, oh, open calls are so, it's like we had to sit there for three days listening to Purple Summer, Purple Rain, whatever that song was, <laughs> over and over again. And I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> um, luckily she was very sweet and patient. Um, That's good. <laughs> but, but again, you're like, please God be good. Even at open calls, you're like, oh, please be good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, I, I want to finish my job. Please be good. <laughs> yes. I would like to go home. Yes. But definitely a very different experience than when you're working on a TV show or on a movie. Right. And, um, you recently got back into the acting side of things, right? Yeah, so I I was acting. I did a national tour and I did a bunch regionally and then went back into casting for a while and then felt rusty. So I went back to grad school, actually, and I got my my master's in classical oh, wow. acting at the London Academy of Music and Dramatic Art. Oh, my um, God, that is so cool. It was fun. Yeah, I had studied abroad there in undergrad and loved London and loved the school. And thank God they let me in. Um, <laughs> and up to that point, I'd mostly just done musical theater. And this master's was just classical text. So the most contemporary thing we worked on was restoration comedy. And oh, um, mostly it was Shakespeare. And because it scared me. And I was like, so this is good. And I, had a, I have a good friend who's a choreographer and a dancer. And she was like, it's probably good for you, Michael. Shakespeare is kind of like, you know, it's like ballet for dancers. Even if you don't do it, it's like broccoli. It's good for you. Um, so so went and studied there. And it was one of the greatest experiences of my life. Yeah. And then came back and jumped right back into acting. That's amazing. I, I love that. I Lambda is one of those places that when you grow up as an actor, it's like kind of like a dream place. Ah, oh, yeah, it was it was magical. And to to study in London is wonderful, too, because they they have connections everywhere. So we would do like movement workshops at the Globe on the stage with their head of movement. Oh, my God. You know, or workshops at the the National and at the, the RSC with the people who run those companies. Um, it was very cool, like getting to do a Shakespearean monologue on the stage at the Globe with their head of movement, you know, giving, no working way. with us. It was very, I, very cool. I would pass out. There's no oh. way I could even get to the stage. Like there I'd was... pass out before. Oh yeah. Like just walking backstage, you know, and they make it a whole experience, obviously, you know, you're backstage and she's like, this is a sacred space. I'm going to open the doors and you sort of merge <laughs> into the space. I'd like to breathe. And you're just like, of course, this is magical. <laughs> whatever you say whatever you say exactly <laughs> that's amazing oh my gosh I can't even imagine that sounds like such a, a really just enlightening experience yeah, and it's it just so cool and going back into training as an adult to after having been in the business for so long oh there's something so wonderful about being like oh all I have to do is be an actor and study I don't have to worry about auditions I don't have to worry about day jobs. I don't have to worry about rent because I got, you know, whole student loans, which I'll pay back eventually. But at the moment, I'm just going to think about how much I can just be an actor for a period of time, um, which was wonderful. And that's very interesting because most of the times, at least, you know, people out in um, LA and New York who are struggling with paying rent and doing all the normal things that you need to do. And you go to your weekly class and it's Mm -hmm. like, great, I get this one hour of feeling something and then I go back to my struggling to stay alive as an artist life yeah which that's it's hard I mean I think that's one of the hardest parts about being an actor is having that sort of emotional um stability and not getting too emotionally exhausted trying to balance that where you're like okay I need to do all these 50 million other things to you know survive just so I can go to get you know do my three minute audition right yeah I know I I I consistently say I wish on any star that I could have loved something different. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. I have a good friend who's a very successful actor and he he's older and he mentors a lot. And that's what he tells young actors. He's like, if there's literally anything else you can imagine yourself doing, go do it. Go do it right now. Lifestyle. (laughs) Yeah. It's like the lifestyle is just so hard at times. And 
you have to really want this. If you've ever thought accounting sounded fun, go be an accountant and, <laughs> and take voice lessons in your spare time. Like, live your spreadsheet dreams, you know? Oh my gosh. <laughs> live your spreadsheet dreams. I love you know, that. Some people love Excel. I don't. It confuses me, but some people are good at it and they should thrive in that world. They should. They should. It's honestly a skill. I've looked at Excel spreadsheets before and have been like, I don't know what this is. So I'm just going to shut it down. Exactly. Things blink at you. They move. I'm like, ah, all I did was hit enter and I'm on a whole new screen. You can shop from anywhere doing pretty much anything. You might shop while working, eating, or even listening to this podcast. And however you shop, we all know and love the thrill of the hunt. But do you also know how to get the thrill of the best deals? Because Rakuten shoppers do. With Rakuten, they get the deals they love with the most savings and cash back. And you can get it too. Start getting cash back at your favorite stores like Sephora, Nike, and even Expedia if you're looking to get some travel in. And getting cash back doesn't mean you have to miss out on sales because those can just be stacked right on top. It's easy to use and based on a simple idea. Stores pay Rakuten for sending them shoppers, and Rakuten shares the money with you as cash back through PayPal or check. Download the free Rakuten app and never miss a deal. Or go to Rakuten.com to start getting the most bang for your buck. That's R-A-K-U-T-E-N. As a podcast network, our first priority has always been audio and the stories we're able to share with you. But we also sell merch, and organizing that was made both possible and easy with Shopify. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell and grow at every stage of your business, from the launch your online shop stage all the way to the did we just hit a million orders stage? Whether you're selling scented soap or offering outdoor outfits, Shopify helps you sell everywhere. They have an all-in-one e-commerce platform and in-person POS system, so wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. With the internet's best converting checkout, 36% better on average compared to other leading commerce platforms, Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers. Shopify has allowed us to share something tangible with the podcast community we've built here, selling our beanies, sweatshirts, and mugs to fans of our shows without taking up too much time from all the other work we do to bring you even more great content. And it's not just us. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the U.S. Shopify is also the global force behind Allbirds, Rothy's, and Brooklinen, and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across 175 countries. Because businesses that grow grow with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash realm, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash R-E-A-L-M now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash realm. But that's where, like, I'm the least tech-savvy person I know, which is why it's been such a shock that I've done well on social media. Because, honestly, I can barely turn my phone on, let alone use, like, ed- edit and do things. Yeah. So even my friends, they're like, you're the last person we thought could figure this out. And I'm like, I know. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, I'm aware that I'm awful yeah. at this. I'm very it's okay. aware that most people's grandparents are more Twitter-savvy than I am. Like. <laughs> See, I'm good at the Twitter side of things. The The video making is where they lose me. Mm-hmm. That's I, why I my just, videos are very, very basic. Like I've had people who are like, you should do challenges or cool backgrounds. It's like, if you could get on a call and walk me through how to do that, I will. If you want to set it up for me and then yeah. I'll just do what I was going to do anyway. Basically, that'd be great. yeah. Right now, the extent of my abilities is wearing a wig and pressing record. Which is all you need, truly. I, apparently. Apparently so. <laughs> So let's talk about your new film, Milkwater. Um, yep. You star in it with Robin De Jesus, who's, you know, Broadway royalty. Oh, yeah. Super exciting. Mm-hmm. What um, What's the film about? And do you know when it's going to come out? Uh, so it's been in sort of the festival circuit for a while. And I know there are negotiations now, I believe, with Netflix to come out soon. 
which is very exciting. So it consistently won all these wonderful awards. It kept winning Best Picture and Best Screenplay, which is very exciting. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, it's about this young woman named Milo, who's played by Molly Bernard from Younger, if you know that mm. TV show. Yes. And um, she's wonderful. She plays this young woman who lives in Brooklyn, who's who's kind of lost. She's one of those typical, like, like many of us, I think, experience. We hit our mid-30s and we think life should be figured out and it's not. And um, so she's looking for meaning and she meets this this older gay man and uh, she sort of rashly decides to be a surrogate for him because he's looking to have a baby. And so we follow her over the course of the pregnancy and how she tries to connect meaning to it and how it affects her relationships with her friends, um, with other people in her life. And uh, it's this really interesting journey that she goes on. So Robin plays one of her best friends and I, I play his kind of um, enthusiastic boyfriend. <laughs> um who who loves wearing very very short shorts um oh. even though it's very cold outside um yeah but but he's very sweet his name is teddy and he's one of those people who's just sort of happy to be there Aww. um but it was fun and it was definitely one of those roles that originally was much smaller and then i got on set and morgan our wonderful director um thought i was funny and she let me improv a little bit and she sort of kept working me into more and more of the film as we went on that um, is like the highest compliment you can get on oh, set. Yeah. Yeah. And to talk about like with crazy audition, I know you talk about audition stories. Yeah. That was one of those where I was on my way to work. I was working at TKTS at the time as a patron services rep. And um, my manager sent me the sides in the script at nine o'clock in the morning on my way to work. And he was like, I need a self tape by noon. Oh, I was like, of course okay. you do. <laughs> This was like a last minute casting. I was like, of course you do. Um, somehow managed to get the sides film. Did not read the script because I did not have time. I read the sides and I was like, I don't know. It seems like a lighthearted comedy. He's like, it reminds me of Alexis from Schitt's Creek if she was a gay man in Hell's Kitchen. <laughs> basically, I just did an Alexis impression. That was the first impression of Schitt's Creek I ever did. Amazing. I basically did Alexis and got it in. Found out by five o'clock that afternoon that I booked it. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it was very quick. And then I was on set like within the next week. Um, and show up on set. At that point, I'd read the script and I was like, oh, like, it's light, but it's definitely not a goofy comedy. It's <laughs> dramatic. And the director was like, so, um, yeah, I was so intrigued by you because your take was so different from anybody else's. And I was like, yeah, because they probably read the script. Because they knew what the film was. Because <laughs> they knew what they were doing. <laughs> um, and I swear, usually I'm much more prepared, but I was just, I had no time. And so in this case, it worked out well. And she was like, I got to do this, the first scene, I, I had this little like exit. And she was like, just improv a line as you go out. And it just got funnier and goofier the more takes we did. And so then she was like, yeah, I think we're going to put you in this scene now and this scene. And I wouldn't have lines. Sometimes she'd be like, just make up whatever you want to say. Like, it, was, <laughs> it was great. That's so fun. So, yeah. And luckily, Molly and, and Robin, who I was with, are wonderful. Like Molly Bernard and Robin De Jesus are now two of my favorite people. And playing opposite Robin, who's so gung-ho and so sweet, it just made it very easy, you know? Um, they made it such a welcoming, friendly place to just play, which was great. I love that. Sets like that are so incredibly special because you really don't get the opportunity to play like that as much as you want to. Exactly. And with people like that who, you know, I've watched them for years and I was already a fan of both of them. So it's great when you meet somebody who you're a fan of and they turn out to be lovely and nice <laughs> and, um, <laughs> you know, and at the end now we're friends you know it, so, so yeah I felt I feel very lucky to have worked on that movie well I'm very excited to see it I think it's going to be great and I'm excited to see the very short shorts <laughs> oh my god which nothing like shooting a scene that's supposed to be in the summer in the dead of winter oh and you were <laughs> like, in Brooklyn right yeah and running around outside in a crop top and shorty shorts <laughs> and it's like 20 degrees out <laughs> oh god yeah. And that flip sounds like a nightmare. It, I mean, if I wasn't with it, would have, except for the fact that everyone was so nice and everyone right. thought it was hilarious. <laughs> and, and luckily, everyone on set was great. Like the minute they yelled cut, like four people would run and throw coats on me. Oh, good. Good. <laughs> yeah, <thank God. laughs> it's like everybody warm him up, warm him up. Basically, yeah. Did you do that trick where you hide the, uh, the hand warmers somewhere in your like body? The only place I could have hidden it was somewhere very personal. And, um, <laughs> I, I wasn't that desperate. <laughs> oh, man. That's great. Yeah. Um, so what's next for you? Do you have anything lined up? Um, 
as far as like films or, or TV shows? What do you what do you feel like you're gonna do next? We'll see. I I've definitely been getting more um, TV auditions as quarantine time has become bigger, bigger, and more casting directors follow me, Good. which is exciting. So I love that world, and um, so I I'm very excited to start. Um, getting on people's radar, which is great. And, yeah. um, and writing more. That's but what has been so exciting is I had never really seriously written. And now I've written, I want to say, I, I, I'm 99 episodes in of this quarantine. Wow. Time, and I've written all of them myself. So talk about, you know, an, ex, an exciting journey. And I'm yeah. so much more confident now um, as far as creating. So now I'm collaborating on a, a project with a friend in London, actually, who I met from my days at Lambda. And so we're working on a project together. So so we'll see where that goes. And I've gotten a couple other offers from people now to collaborate on pilots and on different scripts. So so that's what I'm I'm very excited to to continue to pursue and see where yeah, that leads that's, me. Yeah, that's so cool that it's like kind of something that came came out of nowhere almost where it's like you just decided to start creating something and now you've almost formed another career for yeah. another specialty. Yeah. And I think part of that comes from in casting when you're yeah. looking at scripts and analyzing scripts and figuring out characters when you're casting them. I think I've just spent so much time analyzing scripts that <laughs> maybe now I have a decent idea of how to structure them and how they work. I don't know. Well, I mean, quarantine time is hysterical and I'm obsessed and I can't wait to watch more of them. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I would ask you to share a story, but you already shared your your milk water story, which was pretty fantastic. Unless you have another one you want to share, that was a happy story. I, I mean, so many from years. I remember when I was the first audition I ever blew. I think I was like nine years old, and I was super cocky because I had just come <laughs> off of playing Kurt for a year in different productions of The Sound of Music, mm. and I was very fancy. And uh, I went to audition for a production of The Music Man. And oh. for the Gary and Deanna Kit Winthrop. Yes. And I, remember, I was like, well, I don't really need to practice the song because I'm just so good. Like, I'll just be in and nail it. <laughs> and so, and I had a voice teacher at the time. We'd sung it through, but I didn't really know it. And I went in and just completely froze and forgot the words and just <laughs> bombed, bombed that audition. <laughs> and I came out and my mom was like, well, what happened? I was like, well, I was terrible. And, da, da, da. and she's like, well, why were you terrible? And my mom is a clinical psychologist, by the way, who works oh, with wow. adolescents. So she's like, but she she's not like stage mom, stage mom, but she's tough. And she's like, well, why did you blow it, Michael? And I was like, because I didn't practice enough. And so she sent me back in and made me apologize to the director for wasting his time. And oh promised that if he ever sees me again, I'll be more rehearsed next time. And so from then on, that's why usually I'm so prepared. <laughs> it's like I have the scarring experience. <laughs> um, I can't even imagine being sent back in having yeah, to say that. Yeah, she was that. like, you go and you apologize to him because you didn't practice enough. I was like, okay. Oh, oh Bill, my God. Yeah, that director, he ended up casting me in other things. But um, I oh, think good, he, good. I hope he remembers that too. Um, that, yeah, and then the recent one where you're talking about heartbreaking ones, I, uh, I was called in for Jersey Boys and that was the first um, Broadway show I was ever called in for, for a replacement for Frankie because I can sing all of the high. <sighs> falsetto stuff and I'm short and I, I have dark hair. I love that show. It's, oh, it's so good. And they called me in, and I made it to final callbacks and then didn't end up getting it. No. Because I'm not like a, a pingy tenor, I think, in the way that they wanted, but I can do mm. all the falsetto and I look right. And uh, But obviously that, that whole group from Tara Rubin, they're all really sweet. And they called me in four more times for either the Broadway show for Vegas and for the tour and each time didn't get it. Oh and then God. I got called in twice for the movie and then again in the West End. So I've now auditioned for Frankie seven times and still have yet to book it. And then it closed on Broadway and I was like, no. <laughs> You're like, I'll never get my chance. Ne and they made the movie. I was like, I'll never play this. And it closed in London too. I was like, I'll never play this after seven times of getting so close. I mean, um, that's basically torture. Happened. Yeah, at this point, I know all 35 pages of those sides and all like six songs, like like the back of my hand. Oh, oh my god! And that's that, such a that's such an iconic role and person too to, to uh, portray. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Although I remember, I finally saw. I took my parents to see the Broadway show, and they both they finished. They looked at me. They're like, "I don't know, Michael. Vocally, this might have been tough for you." And I was like, "I know. It's probably for the best." Like <laughs> they gave it to those real, like those tenor tenor boys. But yeah. But I saw I it when it came so out close. to to LA, and I took my mom, and she's been obsessed with it ever since. Oh, it's such a good show. Oh, it's so good. It's but, so good. 
Oh, man. Yeah, but uh, alas. <laughs> alas. That's sad and <laughs> torturous. Yeah, each time. Each time I was like, this is my moment. I'm going to get it this time. Each oh, time my God. Robe and they're like, we're so sorry, Michael. Not this time. I was like, uh-huh. It, was it the same casting director each time or were there it, different casting directors? It, it was always somebody from their office. And they oh, got to know me well. Like I'd walk in and be like, hey, Michael, it's been a couple of months. How have you been? <laughs> I was going to say, did they show up bringing you coffee? Like y'all know each other very well yeah, now. Yeah, like, I think there's only so many people who can do that falsetto. So it's always the same little group of us going in for Frankie. So it's always <laughs> like, well, which one of us is going to get it this time? You know? Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show and talking to me. Where can people watch Quarantine Time and where can people follow you? Ah, well, thank you. Um, I'm on Instagram and TikTok as M. Judson Berry. And on YouTube, just look for Michael Judson Berry. And on Twitter, um, M. Judson Berry. Awesome. So I'm I'm all the social medias. All of the social <laughs> medias. I, I just started TikTok, I guess, like a few months ago, and I still don't know what I'm doing. Like, I was like, oh, I'll post my baking things, and then I'll post some political crap, and then I'll post that. I don't know what's happening on it. I think I, I'm just going to delete it. I'm still confused. I was told at the beginning I was doing it wrong, just because I would sit and monologue and not do the dance challenges and everything. And people were like, you're doing TikTok all wrong. But then it, it then videos blew up. So I was like, what the hell? <laughs> Well, you were wrong, sir. Apparently, so. I'm doing it right. So I, I think there's <laughs> no rhyme or reason. I think you should just do what feels good and what makes your heart sing, you know? <laughs> Posting what would make my heart sing would be me sitting there just reading and not doing anything. It would just you know, be 30 seconds of me reading. That sounds like some ASMR wonderfulness. Right. You know, I, I bet because there's that guy who has made become hugely famous for just filming himself sleeping. What? So I think he's, I don't remember where he is. He's somewhere. And yeah, he gets all these sponsorships now from sponsorships from like sheets and, and pajama companies. Oh my God. So maybe, you reading, maybe people would find that very soothing. Maybe. I'm, maybe I'll try that next. There you go. <laughs> well, thank you again. I'm very excited to see your film Milkwater. And I'm super stoked to see what happens with your career next because I think you're super talented and it was oh. great talking to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You too. Thank you. Thanks again to Michael for coming on the show. Stay safe out there, y'all. L.A. is whack. I can't believe I just used that word, but it's whack right now. It is not safe. Please don't go outside. Please stay in your house. If you are an essential worker, thank you. I love you. You have done what no one could have thought would need to be done. You have put your life on the line for us every single day. And I am eternally grateful to you. We all are. Thank you. I love you. Please be safe, everyone. And stay inside. Make sure you're subscribed to the show wherever you're listening to it right now. Leave us a review, some stars. Love that. Tell your friends. Tell your family. And as always, thanks for coming in. Hi, I'm Alexis Ohanian. You may know me as one of the co-founders of Reddit, but more recently, a large part of my identity is being a father to my two wonderful daughters. In my podcast, Business Dad, I'm hoping to open up the conversation about balancing careers and family. The one thing I constantly hear successful people say, without fail, is that they wish they'd spent more time with their kids. That's time no one can get back. So I decided to create Business Dad to engage in the conversation about how we're spending our time now providing a forum for successful dads to share their joys and challenges of being a working parent. You'll get to hear from a wide range of business dads, from Rain Wilson and Guy Raz to Todd Carmichael and Shane Battier. And while this podcast will talk about business and will definitely be featuring dads, I think everyone can learn something from these incredible conversations as we unpack the expectations we all have about careers, relationships, and ourselves. Business Dad is available now, so be sure to listen and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts.